Oh. We are live, sir. We can start. Yes. Good evening, uh, Professor Anjoni. Good evening, you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, POSI members and the uh, viewers across the world. This is a 25th Silver Jubilee webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society, and I welcome you all to this. Before I hand over to Professor Ashok Jolly to introduce our faculty, uh, I will take you to the journey. Uh, we started on the 25th of March, and this three and a half month, we had uh, 25 webinars. And actually, our webmaster, Dr. Talal, has calculated that this is more than two times or three times the actual conference. I just would like to say thanks to uh, the most important pillar of uh, this webinars. The first, and that is the foremost, is audience. The viewership of our webinar ranges from 2,000 to 4,500 maximum. And these viewers are not only from India, but at least 15 countries worldwide. I shall also like to thank our faculty. And we have nine countries from where we have faculty. That include India, USA, Canada, Switzerland, Japan, Italy, and UAE. The France and Australia, they are going to join us in the list next month. Special thanks to our POSI panelists. 50 panelists have participated their cases and participated in the discussion in these webinars. And I shall also like to thank Dr. Ashok Shyam and Dr. Neeraj Bajlani of Ortho TV for providing the technical support to these webinars. So with this, I hand over to Professor Ashok to introduce our faculty. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diren. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening to all our viewers. It is my great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Professor Antonio Andreacchio, to the viewers of this webinar. Many of you know him because of his visit to Mumbai during the Silver Jubilee OSICON in 2019. Always smiling and jovial, as you will see, Tony, as we call him, is chairman of the Pediatric Orthopedic Department at Buzi Children's Hospital in Milan, Italy. Milan, as you all know, is famous as the global capital for fashion and design. For long years, Tony was chief of pediatric orthopedics at the Children's Hospital in Turin before his move to Milan. He worked in Milan as a resident and then as a pediatric orthopedic fellow, completing his fellowship in 1995, after which he went to the DuPont Institute in Wilmington, US as a research fellow in 1997. After his return in his early days, he was busy in different hospitals in Milan and Alexandria as orthopedic surgeon before moving back to Turin and eventually to Milan. Now, Tony is vice president of EPOS. His presidency actually shifted to 2021. He is also the specialty editor for Troma for JPOB and an editorial board member of JPOB as also of the Journal of Children's Orthopedics in since 2007. He has three books to his credit, 11 chapters and over 100 publications. His fields of interest are trauma, infection, benign bone tumors, and uh, cerebral palsy, club foot, rare disorders, all these, you know. He's going to be speaking to us on management of distal and proximal fractures of long bones using elastic nailing. This, as you all know, is a difficult area with hardly any published literature on the results and complication of this approach. And I'm sure Tony will do full justice to this, as also he will probably give you an idea of comparison of different approaches and different type of implants. I hope he does that, you know, so that we know whether we are wise in using elastic nailing for these type of fractures. So over to you, Tony. I'm sure we are going to have a great time with you. Tony, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashok. Thank you to the POSI and all the members for the, your kindly invitation. And I'd like to, to introduce uh, this talk uh, about the possibility to use the elastic stable intramedullary nail and uh, in this way to treat uh, different uh, kinds of fracture, nor, nor typical, but a little bit uh, more distal or proximal side. So, uh, 
let me know how to proceed. Okay, so the pediatric trauma is the first case cause of a death and uh, compensation claims and hospitalization. And uh, the, the factor who plays a, a, a big uh, a responsibility for that is uh, the play in the one fourth of the cases in sports, almost uh, 20% and other causes is 42%. So the treatment of the long bone fractures in children has undergone a radical change over the last uh, past 25 years and from almost exclusively conservative approach we have moved to an increasing surgical approach so the conception and introduction of the elastic intermediary nailing method developed in nancy in france along with obtaining uh, excellent results and the little adverse events and from france it has spread progressively throughout the world so the names has changed in between the countries, but uh, the, in France is Embrochage Centre Medullar Elastic Stable, Elastic Stable Intermedullary Nailing uh, for the most of the country in Europe and Flexible Intermedullary Nailing in the United States. So the principle of healing is very important because it's a synthesis with its performance closed without to open the, the, the fracture and determines a healing in a conservative treatment that occurs thanks to the periostal callus. So it aims to reduce and stabilize in the meantime and uh, it uh, at, uh, due to the banded nades. And uh, this is very important, uh, the concept is to have uh, three points of support. So uh, in this way, the biomechanics are respected and we have a stability on the axial and translation, flexion and rotation. So in this way, we have a really stable uh, fracture. The indication are due, uh, is uh, due to the three uh, factors. The, the first one is the patient age and there is a, a lower and especially upper limit. There is a, the type of fracture and uh, especially for the fracture side. Other uh, factors very important to consider when you approach this kind of treatment is that the lower limit is uh, four or five years or otherwise you can consider the weight is uh, almost 25 kilograms. On the other side is a upper limit of 13 or 14 years or 55 kilograms. But uh, recently, Richard from Dallas is a, a developer comes that is a, it depends even from the materials of the, of the, of the nails. A little bit of history. And uh, at the end of the 70s, Jean-Paul Metezo was a senior resident at the time. And uh, Jean-Noël Liger and uh, the professor uh, Jean Prévost was chair at, the, at this time. He, he, he died uh, last year. They were working in the hospital Des Enfants in Nancy to develop a system which could fix the femoral children's fracture. So this is the date of the first uh, fixation of this first uh, uh, fracture treated with this method. It was Mathieu, nine year old, was the first patient treated with uh, for the, his femur, femur fracture. And uh, he reported that this accident injury due to a traffic accident riding a bicycle. And in this, in this at the time you can see here, you can find that there was used four intramedullary nades implanted. So the first implant was designed like a little bit uh, as a Eiffel Tower shape. And later the idea of using only two nails were, uh, was developed. So on uh, March on the 1980, Frederick was uh, the first uh, boy who fractured his uh, uh, femur and he was treated by Metazo using just for the first time, just only two intramedullary nails. So after the 80s, there has been a real spread of the method all over the world and the technique was uh, perfected and the method uh, applied to the other district. So since 1981, uh, the staff in NC joined uh, Pierre Lascombe and he developed the, the, the method further. So uh, it's very important to, to understand that the philosophy of this kind of method is uh, due to the, the two nails gives uh, stability to the fracture. And in the meantime, axial and rotational stability 
is a really mini invasive surgical approach with very short scar. And the, 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 the system is a continuous dynamism and per, uh, allow it uh, to have uh, a more rapid uh, healing. So the main advantage of this method is promote rapid healing by preserving the medullary canal and their presence reduce the medium term risk of refracture. This is uh, some specimen uh, uh, who uh, Pierre Lascombe gave me this, uh, these uh, slides and you can appreciate here the, the periostal callus, but in the meantime, even the endostal callus. There, there is a, a big respect of the vascularization of the bone and don't injury the, the external periostal or internal uh, vascularity. That's one of the secret of this method. Uh, other uh, tricks or, or tip is uh, the small, uh, smooth tip or like a, a hockey stick shape of the, of the nail. The very important issue is to calculate uh, before the, the surgery the diameter of the uh, medullary canal in order for the femur, for instance, to have a 40% of, uh, 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 of the minimum um, of the in order to, to, to choose the, the right size of, of, the, of the nail and the pre-band the, uh, the nail before the insertion. It's very important, of course, to choose the, the two nails of the same size, otherwise there is a potential displacement risk. So uh, resuming is two nails, same size, face to face, Ratio in the femur is 40% of the uh, occupation of the medullary canal and maximum bending at fracture site. In this way, we can have a, a system which is in the, in the meantime, elastic and stable. And the, the deformation during the, the, the weight bearing could be uh, in one way to absorb it from one side or the other, uh, the other side. So when we have a compression forces, we have tension forces with the virus deformity, but the, from the other side, there is the other nail uh, who return to equilibrium. The same side with the valgus deformity, with the tension forces, compression forces from the other side and return to equilibrium. So this is very important. So we we'll, we'll try to, to examine some uh, particular uh, cases of, uh, of this technique which was born of just only to treat the diaphyseal fracture. And we can start with the femur. The femur we can use a retrograde or ascendant technique. And in this, um, in this part of our talk, we are taking consideration the proximal one third. So we, uh, we have the, some of my friends and colleagues, we published uh, this uh, uh, recently paper in order to try to, to treat this proximal femur fracture. There are usually the many people consider too, too, too much unstable in order to treat with this uh, kind of uh, method. But you can find here the, the post-op and the six months post-op, there is a, a really good uh, uh, healing of the fracture. This is another example for a boy 11 years old. This is the, the third proximal uh, part of the femur post-op uh, and four months post-op. There is a, a good healing of the fracture seven and uh, seven months post-op. So uh, even for the pathological fracture is a, a good method in order to, uh, to try to join even the, the, the healing of the fracture and even to heal the uh, unicameral bone cyst or the benign tumors. So, so this technique was the first spread from uh, uh, Roposh on GBJS in 2000. And we, pr uh, we published the, this study on JPO in 2006. And you can find here is a pathological fracture of the proximal femur. And just only using two nails, not only we uh, uh, replaced the, the a good alignment and we had a good healing of the fracture, but we obtained it even after three years, a good uh, healing of the, uh, of the bone, uh, of the disease. For the distal femur, there is uh, some technical tips. And uh, because we have anterograde or, or descending technique, so in this way, is just only for the uh, third distal fracture of the femur. 
And uh, uh, you can see here, there is a, a very distal fracture site. And in this case, we have just one only surgical approach in the, uh, below the great trochanter. And it's very important to preventing the two nails. The first is in the, in the proper way, the typical C shape. And the second, you can use as S shape nail. So in this way, we have to introduce, but not in the same plan, uh, plan because otherwise we have uh, uh, more exposure to um, fracture during the introducing of the nails. So we have to, uh, after just one incision, and then we have two different entry points in the uh, different planes in order to avoid this uh, possibly complication. And you can see here in these uh, pictures. So when you insert the first nail, introduce the simply prevent nail in C shape and reduce the fracture and then achieve the primary stabilization. After that, insert the S shape prevent and up, uh, prevent nail. And after the first contact with the cortical bone on the opposite side, turn the nail of 180 degrees in order to catch the uh, distal fragment and to fix the fracture. This is uh, some example of uh, this uh, distal fracture of the femur. And uh, you can see here the uh, good alignment of the fracture. This is a, a third distal uh, fracture trunk and it is very good stability and uh, the possibility after four months, there is a good uh, uh, callus formation. This is another uh, example of uh, this kind of fracture and uh, pre-op, post-op, and after four months, you can see a very important uh, callus formation, a good healing of the, of the fracture. Another example with a third fragment, you have to recall if you respect the, the principle of the three points of contact, even if you have uh, some fragment, you can use the same uh, technique in order to stabilize the fracture. And even in this case, you can see a good alignment. And after six, uh, seven months post-op, there is a good uh, uh, alignment on the fracture after the, the removal of the nails. Another issue, uh, a very challenging uh, fracture is the distal tibial fracture because uh, there are, uh, the, the, the distal fragment of the fracture is very tiny or very short and it's very difficult to, to treat this kind of fracture. And uh, uh, Dolzamski and, uh, reported the first uh, uh, study and uh, some cases and uh, it presents uh, two displacement typical types is a valgus recurvatum or virus procurvatum. So uh, although metazo technique is minimally invasive and too easy to learn, distal tibia is a really challenging due to the relatively short length of the distant fragment and the proximity of the grow plate. So in such injuries, it's difficult to have the nails properly cross above the below the fracture line and surgical techniques uh, require a very good uh, uh, way to introduce. In some cases, very few cases, you can see even in this case, in order to have a more stability, uh, uh, we can achieve it uh, by anchoring the tip of the nails in the epiphysis. Is it not to cross uh, absolutely all the physis, but you can uh, a little bit uh, get over, like in this case, and uh, with each nail does not sufficiently to damage the epiphyseal plate to create permanent growth disturbances. This is very important, don't cross several times, just one, one time in order to fix uh, in, the, in the bone uh, the, the nails. Uh, you can see after four months, there is Harris Park line, which demonstrates that the, 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 the grow is, uh, has restarted without any injuries to the distal part of the of the bone is not uh, the usual technique, but you have to know that even if you anchor just a little bit, you can just one time, not uh, several times, you don't have uh, the high risk to injury the, the growth plate. 
So compared to the external fixation and percutaneous Kishner wire, this method uh, uh, has uh, reduced the risk of fracture displacement and the patient compliance is considerably higher. Another good point is the shortest surgical time compared to other surgical techniques. So this is a severely displaced tibia with a metaphysical fracture associated with fibular fracture close to the crow plate requires stabilization of the fibula as well. So we published the paper and we demonstrated that this, uh, um, the, the fracture of the, the fibula, the, the same level of the fracture of the tibia is very dangerous in order to uh, lose stability. So you can see here the post-op and uh, after a few days we, uh, we realized that there is a displacement because the, the same, uh, the, the fracture of the fibula doesn't have uh, enough stability. So we return to the OR and stabilize the, the, the fibula as well. And so after fifth month, we have a good uh, uh, healing of the, of the fracture. So this is a clinical case and, and the x-ray and the admission and the ER. And in this, in this case, we introduce it directly, even we stabilize even the fibula and we have a good uh, outcome after nine, nine months. This is another case. And this is a Matteo who was a seven years old and he was treated at the beginning with a cast and uh, went to our uh, observation after two weeks post-injury. And uh, we decided uh, anyway to, to treat this patient and to stabilize with the azine. And this is the post-op after if the two, two weeks is uh, could be a little bit later, but after one month and at the end, we have a good outcome. Uh, really, uh, people and the family were satisfied. And this was our paper. We published the Howard study on this, uh, on this topic. So in conclusion, in our opinion, surgery is recommended for displaced distal tibia metaphysial fracture, angulation more than 25 degrees and translation more than 30% with or without associated fibular fracture, that in severely displaced distal tibia metaphysial fractures with associated fibular fracture close to the growth plate require stabilization of the fibula as well, as I mentioned before. And moreover, surgical treatment is indicated in high energy trauma with elevated risk of a compartmental syndrome. And such patient immobilization can be achieved with a posterior splint rather than a circular cast and that is more easier to treat. Other big topic is uh, proximal humerus. It's a very challenging fracture, unstable like in this case. We have a... Uh, uh, topographic uh, classification of the uh, humerus fracture in the proximal shaft and distal diaphyseal metaphyseal junction fracture and distal. So we can uh, first treat the proximal fracture and they are very uh, more, uh, more common than the shaft on the distal diametaphyseal junction. And as you know, there is a, this region has a, a really high remodeling potential because the the the, the is uh, the the growth plate is very close to the active growth plate, and so there is a big uh, range of motion in this uh, in this portion of the humerus. And after that, as everybody knows, there is eighty percent of the growth of uh, potential of the humerus. That means uh, high remodeling potential and rapid consolidation. And uh, uh, the remodeling potential is uh, on the main axis of the movement for all the fracture. And uh, just because the shoulder has the most important uh, movement all, all over all the planes of the movement, so that's the reason why the, the, this part of the humor is as a remodeling very, very high. So uh, the conservative uh, treatment is applicable to almost all fracture, but uh, we are to consider skeletally mature patient where we can have a Malonian or less remodeling due to the age and open or pathologic fracture. So immobilization is a good way with a splint, bandage, or whatever you want for three or uh, four weeks. We need... Uh, uh, X-ray check, and uh, we can have a uh, uh, you have good uh, follow-up. 
So when surgery is indicated in this part of the, this fracture. So this is a, a paper of Palavan in 2011, is a meta-analysis with 14, uh, 14 articles uh, with level four of evidence. And uh, he reported excellent outcome and surgery is almost the same of conservative treatment. But sometimes the functional outcome is less because the displacement is more important and we have to consider the age as a discriminant factor. So uh, there is no X-ray criteria for Palomani in his paper uh, with a surgery versus conservative treatment. And in patients less than 10 years old, the conservative treatment, almost 100% of good results and treating this, uh, this fracture. So for the patient who are more than 13 years old, the surgery sometimes has more advantages than conservative treatment. And uh, uh, um, this, after the 10, 13 years of age, we have to consider case by case in order to better to appreciate which kind of fracture we have and how to treat it. So, uh, for the, from the surgery point of view, we have several options. There is a percutaneous gay wires, it's a fair option, is a pretty easy, uh, even is not so easy, but anyway, is a more easy uh, way to treat this kind of fracture. And the second option is elastic stable intramedullary nail. Then for the mature patient, we have plates or locked nails, but is for the skeletally mature patient. So uh, Metezo described the original technique in 1982 and its application have been widely developed in pediatric orthopedic surgery. This technique is easy to learn, minimally invasive, and has a low reported rate of post-op complication. So this is uh, just a reminder in order, which is the approach, is the lateral approach, just one incision and to introduce with one hole or two holes the two nails with the, with the same technique. Uh, but you have to consider the, the ratio for the, um, for the humerus is a little bit less. So you consider a 30% of occupation of, of the medullary canal. So a little bit more thin uh, nails. And uh, you can proceed all together in order to try to avoid a course through phenomenon. Otherwise you have uh, you know, the possibility to not progress in the proper way. So you can see you, you have to progress all uh, with the both nails together and then to approach the, the fracture just because even you are not be able to consider which is of the two nails, which is the best in order to catch the fracture and reduce it. And so when you, when you arrive very close to the fracture, you can, you can start to, to engage the, the humor head and to, then to turn your, your nail and to reduce the, the, the fracture. This is a completely displacement of the metaphysial fracture. And this is the post-op X-ray. And after four months, it's completely healing of the fracture, almost completely healing. And this is another case with a completely displacement, 100%. Uh, and after two months, and then you can appreciate here, six months post-op, a complete healing of the, the fracture. This is another patient with the same kind of fracture, completely dislocated, and uh, uh, a good... Uh, a good reduction, even in this case, just not dot to by violate the the phases, just a little bit, just to, for anchorage. And after you know, few months, four months, there is a, no more engagement in the phases and no uh, no disturbances of the growth. So even in this case, you can find not only the the X-ray, but even the the range of movement after only one month is completely restoring the range of movement. That's the reason why uh, I, I like or I prefer to use this kind of, uh, of, of treatment. So uh, this Atkinson 
and uh, and the Boston uh, Hospital published this paper on JPO in 2011, and they have a, a comparison between a percutaneous K wires treatment versus uh, elastic stable intramedullary nail, and they had uh, they reported a similar rate of complication and similar functional outcome, but there was a of course, K wires were less exp expensive and uh, is an outpatient clinic for removal of the K wires. On the other side, the, the, they report a worse post op reduction in K wires and difficult to maintain reduction in K wires. So the uh, elastic stable intramedullary nail had a better. Uh, outcome from the radiological point of view and restoring of the movement. This is a comparison of uh, several papers on this issue. And the, the last one in 2014 is our paper. And we have a more, we, we, we prefer to, to treat this patient with more dislocation, is translocation and angulation more than 50%, and with the age uh, less than 10 years on average. And uh, uh, in the, our uh, paper, we reported the good pain control, early mobilization, and excellent functional outcome during follow up at, at where removal. So we treated the, um, uh, almost uh, 57 uh, patients with uh, ASIN and uh, we scaled them with a mean quick dash test and we have a, a really good uh, functional outcome. So in conclusion, this is a relatively frequent uh, fracture with the high remodeling potential, especially in young patient, and uh, because very close to the active crow plate and close to the glenohumeral joint, with a rapid consolidation. And uh, the preferred option is uh, first is a conservative treatment, but sometimes uh, surgery is needed, especially for the older patient, severely displaced fracture, upper fracture, or pathologic one. And in this way, we have uh, we can uh, achieve uh, early mobilization. So uh, is a frequent, a benign fracture, remodeling potential, and good prognosis, and conservative is okay. But uh, when the the, the age increasing and uh, getting older, uh, ten. 0.2 years in the latest case. Uh, the remodeling is uh, uh, still uh, pretty high, good prognosis, and the conservative is, uh, uh, of course, it works. But uh, when we have a, a patient uh, very close to the skeletal maturity, the remodeling is a little bit uh, less, and uh, the conservative treatment could be not the, the real best option. And so the conservative treatment is not a dogma. And so we have to consider another kind of, uh, of treatment. And then in this case, we have even the, the possibility to publish on JPOB this, uh, our uh, results and our paper, and we are the, the very proud to have the, the cover. Uh, other very challenging fracture uh, we can treat with this method is uh, the, the fracture of the distal, diaphyseal, metaphyseal junction. It's very difficult, uh, uh, difficult to fracture to treat. And is a really uh, rare injury, is almost 1% of the humerus fracture, is really uh, secondary to high energy trauma. So the instability is really high, and that's the reason why we have it difficult to control the, the rotation. The goal of our treatment is almost the same, is to stabilize the fracture, control the rotation, and to recall the rotational malalignment does not remodel. So uh, more than 10 degrees uh, of uh, malalignment and for the rotational instability uh, carries a functional impact of uh, the function. So almost all this fracture need surgical treatment. So that's the reason why it's pretty rare, but we have to consider almost all the time to, to treat it surgically. So we can use uh, K-wires, elastic stable intramedullary nail, or external fixator. Kirchner wires can be a good method, but they have uh, poor stability and uh, especially poor rotational control. For the uh, elastic stable intramedullary nail, you have uh, to consider anterograde introduction and uh, you uh, consider even in this case, uh, really uh, a little bit more uh, thin 
hazing to, to choose is 20-25% uh, of the ratio. And in order to uh, achieve a good stability, rotational control, and early recover of the, and the joint uh, uh, and the, the range of motion of the joint. For the Excel fixator, it is a poorly tolerated in childhood usually, and uh, is a little bit cumbersome, and uh, they, the, the children uh, don't like too much to have uh, this uh, device. And uh, sometimes we have uh, some uh, superficial infection of the pin tracks. So just a little bit, uh, just a recall of the anatomy and the, the shape of the humerus because from the diaphysial, which is round, we, we pass it to uh, this part is a triangular shape. And in the end, this is a like eight uh, shape. So uh, it, that's very important. It, this uh, justifies the, the instability of the fracture. In the meantime, you have to uh, recall um, just because from diaphysis is round and distal metadiaphysial junction is triangular and then in the elbow. So we have to engage from one nail, the lateral column and the other nails to, uh, to fix the medial column. And that's uh, just a, a little a bit uh, you know, uh, some pictures in order to recall how to the introduction just uh, uh, below the tip of the insertion of the of the muscle and then to introduce uh, on the different plane like in the in the proximal femur fracture uh, you have to introduce and then uh, progress together and try to engage from the lateral column and medial column in order to fix the the, the fracture so this is a boy, nine years old, with this kind of fracture. You can even appreciate with a CT scan the displacement at that kind of, of fracture. And this is the, the, the reduction at the end of the surgery. And this one is, this is the, a girl. And after 45 days of post-op, you can, you can see the completely restore of the, the motion. And there's a, another young boy, just four years old. And uh, you can appreciate here the a good uh, post-op re reduction. Uh, very important callus formation just after one month. And after six months, it completely restoring and remodeling of the distal uh, fracture. And here you can find one year post-op. Uh, Gabriele is a 15 years boy. And even in this case, you can bene, find bene, bene, bene. completely restoring of the uh, range of motion. And this is a particular case, is a, uh, is a girl, 14 years old, with a tetraplegic pattern. It's very difficult uh, fracture. There is a, a really uh, spastic uh, girl, so it's very difficult to try to maintain a mobilization or containment or whatever. And so this is the post-op. The EP view is not a completely perfect alignment, but it is what, uh, enough in order to reduce the fracture. After two months, this is the, the X-ray, and this is uh, six months. There is a good alignment of the fracture, a good restoring of the gap in the AP view and lateral view is perfect alignment. So uh, the patient didn't have uh, any immobilization for just uh, just only a sling for a couple of weeks. So in conclusion, is a rare injury, really unstable, and uh, we need uh, uh, to treat uh, surgically this uh, patient in order to have a control of rotation and uh, uh, the sagittal displacement is uh, uh, more remodeling and, and the remodeling is more, much more higher. So for the humerus proximal is a frequent benign and uh, eye remodeling potential, good prognosis and eye conservative uh, potentially uh, options. Uh, for the humerus shaft fracture, you can uh, relatively uncommon, but anyway, the, there is no remodeling and surgery is not contraindicated. For the distal, the uh, metaphysial junction is very rare, but really unstable, and uh, the variable outcome, so the surgery is uh, almost mandatory. And even in this case, we published uh, this uh, our experience with this kind of, uh, of a treatment on uh, JPO. So the last uh, topic is uh, proximal radius. is a really challenge uh, 
uh, fracture as well, and uh, is uh, pretty rare, is uh, one to 5% of all pediatric helper fracture uh, around the nine, 10 years of age, and usually associated with a bulbous loading injury of the elbow, and uh, uh, sometimes elbow dislocation and medial epicondyle fracture. So there is a uh, X-ray classification and uh, is very important to, to appreciate on the X-ray from the minimal to, to completely displaced uh, fracture. And uh, of course, according to the displacement, uh, we have to treat uh, conservatively uh, or surgically. So uh, when you have a conservatively, there is no no problem when you have to uh, approach uh, the, the surgical treatment, we can try to have a close and percutaneously uh, in order to try to avoid to open this kind, this kind of fracture. So uh, for the conservative treatment, the indication is the most of fracture. And if the less than 30 degrees of angulation or more than 30 degree angulation, close reduction and immobilization, if angulation is reduced to less than 30%, that's enough. Just we have to uh, strict follow up and uh, recall to mobilize very early in order to prevent a stiffness. Uh, some technique is a elastic bandage technique, is a tight application as mark uh, fascia in order to, to try to reduce this kind of uh, fracture and to have a, a spontaneous reduction. Is a Patterson maneuver very well known as a, to uh, the surgeon with a with another uh, assistant in order to try uh, distal traction and virus, uh, and virus uh, apply the force in order to, to reduce the, the radial head. Another option is due to the Israeli technique with the flexion uh, uh, more superior and pronation in order to try to reduce the, the, uh, the fracture. And the uh, Neher or Torque technique published on JPO 2003 with uh, uh, try to, to combine an extension and superior per, and then pushing down the, the aphysia, uh, uh, the aphysis of the, of the radius in order to reduce uh, this fracture. So many, many techniques, but sometimes all these techniques can fail. And then when the closed reduction phase, we have to try to approach a surgical uh, reduction. So uh, there is uh, the possibility, uh, the, the indication all the same, and uh, to consider even the translation, more than three or four millimeter of translation uh, can impact on the pronation and supination. That's the reason why we need to have a, a good uh, restoring of the uh, good uh, reduction of this fracture. Uh, recall there is a, a particularity um, finality of the of the vessel of the radial head so that's a particularly dangerous uh, zone and uh, uh, we try uh, every time to try to avoid an open uh, reduction in order to avoid the some uh, uh, complication so this is a wallace technique is a percutaneous reduction and fixation is a blunt pin to push to push radial head back onto the neck and then to k wire fixation like in this diagram, you can you can appreciate the, the to lever arm and then to fixate from proximally to the uh, from proximally to distally. So uh, when you approach this kind of technique, you have to recall to to pawn the the forearm in the pronation in order to avoid the radial nerve, and then you can uh, practice the, the the maneuver the reduction in order to restore a good uh, position. And then we arrive to, uh, to the topic is uh, uh, the metazo technique uh, with an intramedullary pin reduction and the uh, retrograde insertion of the pin across the fracture side. And then the fracture is reduced, rotating the pin uh, of the nail. Uh, the approach is the same for the whole, uh, forearm uh, fracture. So in this uh, distal part, um, of the radius of the lateral part in order to avoid to have some impingement on the, with the extensor uh, tendon extensor so that's the reason why it's better to to have this uh, lateral approach instead of the uh, dorsal approach 
and uh, then to insert the one nail, the, the ratio is with 50% uh, of the medullary canal in this part, and then to progress till uh, uh, the site of the fracture to try to catch the, uh, the radius head and then to reduce and return in uh, reducing and uh, rotating 180% uh, degrees. This is pretty, sometimes it's easy, sometimes not. Uh, this is one, uh, one case. And this is a combining of the two techniques to try to, uh, with a lever arm, uh, to try to reduce first and then to fix the fracture and uh, better to reduce the, this fracture in order to reduce the, the reducing of the fracture. This is another example. You can find complete displacement of the, of the radial head and then you can try to reduce first with a lever arm and then fix with the retrograde uh, nailing. And it, this uh, is a combined technique. You can find here uh, the, to approach with the uh, with elastic stable inch of middle nail till the fracture site, and then to reduce with a lever arm with the K wires in order to, uh, to lift the femoral uh, radial head, not the femoral, the radial head, and then you can to uh, progress and then to try to uh, rotate the the nail in order to have a good reduction of the of the fracture and this is the final outcome so which is the best uh, the pinning or the metazo technique this is a tarallo um, paper in 2013 and they compared the two technique and they found that there is an excellent uh, uh, elbow performance score with a metazo technique and good results and on the other side, we can see there is a, a poor result with the pinning, a KYR spin in 8% of the cases uh, versus 0% with the metazo technique. The radiological healing it was the same, 100%. On the other side, the range of motion was completely in both uh, cases, but if you see the radial head overgrow, which is a, a, a complication of this kind of fracture, with a K wire pinning, there was a, a radial head overgrow more than 43% with the K wire pinning uh, versus the 0% with the radial head overgrow of, with the metazo technique. So the elastic stable inch of medullary nail is, uh, seems to be preferred uh, approach both for the higher uh, range of motion values and for the lower rate of complication. And this is, uh, you can find after one month, these kids is completely restoring the movement and flexion extension and pronus supination. And it was uh, the, the fracture and it was uh, the, the, the results from the uh, radiological point of view. So the surgery is, uh, uh, an indication, uh, the open reduction in indication, but uh, cannot adequately reduce uh, when close or percutaneous method, but there is uh, less range of motion, uh, high rates of an osteonecrosis, and uh, the, the main complication is a synostosis. So uh, loss of pronation uh, more than supination, and there is, a, uh, as I mentioned before, radial head overgrowth, and usually does not affect the function, but is really not uh, really uh, fancy to, to, to see. And then osteonecrosis is another complication, this, this kind of uh, fracture, and uh, it uh, occurs when you have uh, uh, in the 70% when uh, we approach with the open reduction, this kind of fracture. And the most uh, uh, serious complication is the open reduction with extensive or delayed treatment. There is a synostosis which compromised the movement of the elbow and the pronus supination. So uh, don't forget less than 30 degrees immobilization and more than 30 degrees uh, first closed reduction. And if the surgery just is, there is a residual more than 20% and the fixation with percutaneous or metazone nails is a good option uh, to treat this kind of fracture. And just the, the, the late, late uh, option is the open surgery uh, because uh, increased rate of uh, complication. In conclusion, elastic stable is a minimally invasive technique for the treatment of pediatric fracture. This method approximately the physiological healing process of the bone without opening the fracture site. 
the operative stress is minimal and the volume of implants is small, offering a good stability at the meantime. And the occasion can be enlarged to many types of fracture, which are a challenge for the pediatric orthopedic surgeon achieving a good outcome. So Lascombe reported this kind of numbers about the fracture uh, all over the world. Two billion kids in the world uh, means 50 million fractures a year. And uh, the elastic stable intramedullinase is employed in 42% uh, of, the, of the cases. And uh, Narayan uh, published this uh, paper uh, and his conclusion uh, about what is the best treatment, uh, you can find this obvious uh, conclusion uh, because of adequate stabilization, maximize comfort and so on, and uh, probably uh, achieve this goal commonly and cost effectively. I, I guess this method could be combine all these options with the best uh, results. So this is a, just uh, to know where we are. Everybody knows where is Italy and Europe and, uh, and Milan. And this is my hospital. You know, hospital, this is uh, some, uh, some uh, shoots uh, and photograph uh, during the COVID uh, period that there is no people uh, somewhere. And this was my uh, new hospital is a uh, Ospedale Bambini means children's hospital. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Antonio, that was a wonderful presentation, quite comprehensive. And I guess you covered a lot of uh, multiple factors which are in the medication region where we are in. Sandeep, we can't hear you. Can you keep your. Uh -huh. Yeah, please. Hello, can yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Okay. So. I just wanted to thank Dr. Antonio for a comprehensive coverage of all metaphysical fractures. And uh, we have a few questions for him if he can answer those from our OZ members. Can you hear me, Dr. Antonio? I can add you. Okay. The first question is what is your post operative protocol? Because all these fractures don't have a classical spindle and uh, there is a relative stability. Absolutely so, do you use how long? I'm, are I'm so sorry, but your your radio is bad. I Tony, can... it is post operative protocol is asking. Okay. Yeah. Do you use a plaster, or what do you splint, or what do you do? When when you have uh, some uh, kind of fracture is particularly uh, <laughs> unstable, it means uh, for the distal uh, part of the humerus, I just splint for a couple of weeks. If you, uh, if you um, treat the uh, uh, proximal part of the, of the humerus just uh, one week uh, from a splint in order to avoid uh, some, some movement which are practically uh, painful. And uh, what else for the... Uh, for the femur. Tony. For the femur, just a, a splint for the distal part of the femur or the proximal part of the femur, a couple of weeks of a splintage in order to avoid some movements and to take care of the, the child because he's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, is uh, scared and is painful. But uh, as soon as the, the pain of the acute trauma has passed and uh, dominated with a painful killer and whatever, so try to to start with a light movement and start with the, with the movements. Even for the, for the proximal part of the radial head, just one week of immobilization. And after that, to start very, no physiotherapy, but we start on your own, uh, just only to move uh, in this way is be able to, to have, uh, you know, restoring the movements. Yes, then there is another question about the post of physiotherapy. Uh, do you go for any specific therapy or you just leave the child like this? Yeah, just only allow to the, to the child to, because there is some child that are more brave, uh, others is a little bit scary. So I, I guess for my, uh, for my experience, it should be better to leave the, the child for at least one month, the first month, one month, especially for the upper limb, to leave uh, alone, to move uh, as is feeling and then after that is really don't move or is really scared to to address to the very light and mild physiotherapy but in the most of the cases the child is uh, is able to to move on your own or resolve the, 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 
the, the limb. Uh, there is a question from Himal. Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So, Kiranbhai, I think you can ask. Yes. Uh, Himal, I wanted to know. Sandeep, uh, we can't hear you. Sandeep. Yeah, yeah. So, it's like, okay, uh, I'm asking so. the question. Yeah. Yeah. He is asking whether you can cross the Pisces. No. The question uh, is whether you can cross the physis. I think Tony already mentioned about that. Yeah, but there is a, you know, incidental is not um, really, you know, is is not uh, used to 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 violate the the physis. It 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 be happens especially for the distal part of the tibia sometimes uh, because you need uh, something uh, much more uh, tissue to anchor your tip of your of your nails, but just only one times in order to have a. Uh, uh, much better, you know, stability of the distal part of the tibia, just one shot in order to avoid it to, to cross and they cross several times because otherwise like for, for the fixation of the physial when you, when you have a distal part of the physis uh, fracture of the physis of the, of the femur, you have uh, uh, the risk to have uh, a iatrogenic damage. Otherwise, just one tip is the, with the, just the tip, you, if uh, you violate the physis, you don't have any real trouble with, uh, with the growth. But it's not due to every time, just uh, very few cases. And when in particular cases, you need a, a little bit more, you feel you need more stability, you can just a little bit cross the physis. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. <laughs> Better. <laughs> no, Sandeep. No, something is wrong with your Wi-Fi. <laughs> anyway, Tony, if I may ask you a question, you know, two questions actually. Okay. One is like uh, you didn't mention anything about complications, you know. So, what sort of complications, for example, malunion in different planes, you know, in the coronal and the sagittal plane, you didn't talk about the lower femur, for example. You know, that's one. And second, would you say there are some contraindications to distal fixation, you know? So if your fracture is very low, would you still use uh, the easing technique, you know, elastic nailing? The, would you the, say there is some contraindication in some cases? The contraindication, the main contraindication for my experience is the age and the, the weight of the patient. So when the patient is more than 55 kilograms, it's really difficult sometimes to have a good manage of the, of the patient because the muscle force can displace the fracture there. And so the, the, especially for the lower limb is very important. And the femur is more, a little bit more dangerous, I mean, uh, uh, respect to the, uh, the tibia because the femur is a shape, you know, it's not completely straight, but it's a, a little bit curved. And in this way, the, the, the nail uh, adapted in the different, uh, uh, different way uh, rather than in the tibia. The tibia is more straight. And even as the patient has a little bit more 50, five kilograms can allow it much better and restore the shaping and, and, and can allow much better this uh, a little bit more extensive or force the technical indication. For the femur, the, the, the situation is um, more delicate and you have to consider the, 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 how, how big is the, the boy, how, how, uh, which is his is, is weight. So some, sometimes, but when there really was, a, um, was a, a, an, an error at the beginning of the indication, there was a, some displacement for the femur due to the, the, the indication for the weight. And the other side, the, the, the complication could be a, a, a not a proper size of the, of the, of the nails. So you have to consider and to uh, calculate the shape, uh, the, um, the size of the, the, the nails, because it's very important to, uh, to connect the, the, the size of the medullary canal with the choosing uh, size of the nails. Otherwise, if you underestimate uh, the size, you have a secondary displacement uh, for, for this reason. The, the yep. third... 
possible uh, com complication is due to the, the not uh, completely uh, bent of the of the nail in the same way, especially for the lower limb, because the lower limb, of course, is a little bit more dangerous and challenging instead of the, of the upper limb, because the lower limb uh, needs to have the, the symmetrical uh, uh, bending of the nails. And so that's the reason why when I bend, pre-bend in the, in the uh, when we start the, the, the surgery, I bend in the same time both, uh, both nails in, in this way, I am a little bit more sure I, I give the same bending of the, the two nails. For the distal part, one, one tips is a, a little bit, uh, two or three bumps with a hammer and then to bend. In this way, you can have uh, the maximum bending at the, at the distal part of the, the site of the fracture when, where uh, I need to have the maximum bending of the, of the of the bending of the nails because uh, for the diaphyseal fracture is more easier, but for the distal part is uh, more difficult. That's uh... So Tony, where do your nails cross each other? I mean, the crossing, you know, it's above the fracture. Yeah. So uh, where do you prefer to get your crossing of the nails? You mean if you if you prefer I approach the, the, with the two nails and then to cross the fracture in the, the, right. the mid side? Yes. I usually I usually prefer uh, you know approach with it both and then to cross with the first or the second because in advance I don't know exactly which is the best nail to to reduce the fracture, but it's just only for the for the experience. Other surgeon prefer to cross with the first and then to approach with the second one, uh, and and the and the other reason why is uh, especially for the upper limb the possibility to have a, a corkscrew phenomenon. So the impingement and the the the, the nails cross each other. So in this way, there's uh, they lose the really uh, biomechanics uh, way to to approach this uh, this fracture, but it's a, it's a personal approach uh, to the fracture. Okay, I think there are some cases which are being presented. Okay. Can you start? This is your case. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? A little yes. bit. Yes. A little bit. Okay. Can yeah. you hear me now? It's clear. Yeah, sure. Better. Yeah. Okay. Before my, I start my case, I want to ask Antonio, Professor Antonio. I find it very difficult sometimes to make the A scarf. C is very easy to maintain, but while making a S carp, I find it difficult. At what point should we reverse the carp? We sure. know that C carp is usually done at the fracture side, but what about the reverse S carp? Did you get my point? What does S carp mean? You mean what, what do you, what for, do you the mean distal, for the distal end of femur? Okay. We use one C carp, mm -hmm. one nail in S fashion, isn't it? Okay. So I want to ask you, is there any special technique of making that S carve? You know, there is no a special technique. I don't know in this in, in this particular fracture. Is I don't know if no, no, not good. this part, not this fracture. Okay. I'm asking you distal femur fracture, distal femur metaphyseal fracture. Okay. So I you can use or C scar uh, C shape. Uh, yes. Otherwise, you can even to have uh, the first, uh, the first nail with the C shape, and the other one with the S shape. Yes, but it's a little bit more difficult to have the S, a good S shape because you have to yes. to start with the C shape first, and then when you can introduce, you're bending on the opposite side when you bump inside with, the, with the, your hammer. And after there is a S sh shape, you can turn 180, uh, 180 degrees. 180 degrees. degrees. Right. Yeah, but it, it's a little bit more difficult and challenging. Sometimes yes, yes, it's yes. better to use just only two in the C shape and it works in the same time as it, it works. It's very important to try to have the maximum of the bending of the distal part of the uh, of the nails. That's a, the that's a reason why uh, for my experience as uh, taught me uh, Pierre Lascombe, after one or two uh, tips of the hammer, you bend the, the, the nail. And in this way, after, uh, after uh, every 
two or three centimeter in, inside you can bend and okay. in this way you can have a, you can achieve a, a good uh, bending of the distal part of the nail okay doctor so last okay you thank you yes okay uh, this is a 11 year old boy mm -hmm. he had history of a road traffic accident and he came to me just one day post injury and this is the x-ray there was no distal neurovascular deficit this is a proximal third shaft fracture which is comminuted with a long butterfly fragment so inherently it is an unstable fracture next sandeep sandeep next yes yes so i had this following options traction then spica as it is unstable elastic nail and end caps to prevent collapse or elastic nail and x fix or only x fix so shall i proceed yes so what i yes you want continue. to ask professor what is uh, no what is the consensus what is the just go back so i want to ask professor antonio that what would have he would have done for this case i probably use uh, uh, as approaches in the beginning the the external fixator because it, 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 the the third fragment is too large and i afraid they are not be able the concept of the three points because uh, is too extensive the part uh, of the fracture where the the nails have to uh, express their you know uh, extension so the problem right. is uh, the, the below uh, uh, over and at the level of the fracture you should have a good uh, uh, bending in order to express a good stability for this fracture i guess is too large the fragment they are not be able to to have this biomechanical uh, concept okay so since the child was less than 50 kg so i tried uh, retrograde elastic nail okay and with ao external fixator temporarily to prevent collapse till there is some amount of callus to make it stable next sandeep this is down the line 3 weeks next then after 4 weeks when there was sufficient callus i removed the external fixator and started mobilizing the patient this is six week follow up. You can see there is union with no further collapse. Next. This is the post operative. I mean, when the child started walking, I think video is not working. What I found in this case that after just uh, after removal of the fixator, patient had some amount of abduction deformity at the hip joint. So what can that be? What can be the cause of that? The problem is the effect of the mal rotation. I, I can, you know, because there is no a perfect alignment and uh, it was an not perfect uh, uh, configuration of the of the nails. And from my point of view, but it just right. only because there is no criticism. It's just only mm. because I, I, when I used uh, as a one or two cases, uh, the the external fixator later was a, a complication of uh, due to uh, a, a no perfect technique or a, a, a loss of a reduction. And so, in the second time, I used the the, the external fixator. Maybe in in this case, you can achieve a better. Uh, better reduction with external fixation at the beginning and uh, to avoid the, the, the other uh, okay. the other technique okay. just just only to, to discuss because uh, the, I, I i recall that the big uh, is too too big the the third fragment of the of the femur okay the butterfly fragment yeah exactly okay, thank you can i go to the next case yes yes this is 11 years old female child Again, road traffic accident, and uh, you can see there is a subtrock fracture, more or less transverse. So, what is the opinion of the faculties? 
Ten. For sure, no, no, no conservative. <laughs> That's for no, sure. Yes, I'm asking whether <laughs> tens elastic nail or I pediatric can, I, or pediatric DHS or what I used that internal is, fixation with fillos that is uh, adult proximal femoral yeah. locking plate. I guess at 11 years old you can uh, you can approach uh, you can treat it with a uh, yeah, elastic stable intermedial nail. You have but enough. Do, uh, don't you a, think it, that proximal fragment is very short? I, I think it, yes, but it's not so short. Yeah, I mean, I, I treated even to, to shorten this one. So okay. uh, you have enough in order to progress uh, till uh, to the proximal uh, part of the uh, distal part of the physis and you have enough. Like, uh, you know, if you consider as many, many unicameral bone cysts, the same zone and the same uh, yes, yes. Uh, part of the femur you can you can treat and you have a, a, a bone of a low quality uh, instead of this one is, is a normal child so it's a good bone quality. So you can fix and, and, and the the, the, the goal is just only to have a good realignment and to try to, to, try to, to have uh, no shortening and whatever, and no virus deviation or whatever. So the child was about uh, 52 kg body weight. And uh, I thought that only elastic nail can cause a deformity because of tremendous muscle power in the proximal femur. Mm -hmm. And if you see the x-ray, there is also lateral but there is lateral call, I mean, deficiency of the cortex. So what I did, I opened it up with a small incision and reduced it and then put a fixed with phyllose plate, that is proximal femoral locking plate for adult. And what I have seen that while doing phyllose, I mean fixing with phyllose, you have to insert the proximal screws without the locking jig. Okay. Yes, because uh, proximal, uh, the phyllose plates, the fixed angle screws are designed to diverge, to accommodate the head. But here the proximal part is not that much wider. So in proximal three screws, definitely we'll need to pass the four, four mm cancellous screw freehand, not with the locking. Mm -hmm. So okay. now you have the antique AO plate which can Pardon? be used. We yes. have the pediatric AO plate now for proximal uh -huh. plate, for, because which, uh, can, which can be used. Now. Yes, yes, hundred percent. Because at that time it was not available. Not available. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I'll just go ahead because. There is so, achha, one issues. more thing. Just I was very much. I mean, uh, an in anxiety that what would happen if I am sued. That why did he use an adult plate for a pediatric patient? Then I'd find out the. I mean literature and found this paper then there is a paper in favor of adult proximal humerus locking plate for pediatric <laughs> subtract fracture. Next, Sandeep. Yes. So yeah. this is after three months, it is united. So again, 10 years boy, this is again the proximal third, proximal femur, but here the fracture pattern is more spiral. It is not transverse. Next. So again, I used a phyllos that has to be a longer one because of the length of the fracture. I opened it up, put three interfract screw, and then put that plate. Next. Fracture is healing. Next. Six months follow-up. Next. Patient was allowed to bear weight at th three months post-op. Next. So that's it. We so can move to any opinion yeah. or any comment, please. Dr. Antonio, any comments on that? I guess for the last case, for, for the last child, I, I, I for my side, I, I, I think is a is a is a little bit more aggressive uh, approach. Is a long plate with a more, more long scar and so on. Maybe in that case, I I prefer to. To approach with the intramedullary nails, and then in the in this case, if the the, the was a, a shortening or whatever, to use a, a, a 
external fixate or a temporary okay, external right. fixate. Could be a, a less aggressive approach, and maybe uh, considering the age, it could be a good uh, uh, good timing, wheeling, uh, and you can uh, you know save uh, time and and scars and and so ever. But just don't. So Kapil, can you go ahead with your case? Oh, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, the ten-year-old boy who had a high-velocity injury. He fell from the third floor, and he was a heavy kid. And uh, luckily, he survived, and uh, he didn't have any uh, neurovascular deficits, and it was a closed injury. So uh, next slide, uh, Sandeep. Yeah. So uh, we uh, elected to uh, put in uh, elastic nails uh, distal to proximal. And uh, this was the reduction that we got. So, Dr. Antonio, any comments on uh, this? Uh, would you think this is acceptable? Uh, would you have done the same thing, or would you have changed the uh, way you would have treated this child? No, I, I don't have any uh, you know any comment about the, the 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 choice. I have just one comment. Maybe should be bent much more at the fracture side because it is a little bit uh, straight. Uh, is not too much bent the the nades. That's the reason why it's a little bit uh, uh, a risk to have a shortening in this way. If you bend much more, you can more stability and more elastic uh, possibility to have a good. Uh, uh, Good stability of the fracture. Is a, yeah. So, uh, so this is. I think uh, this is uh, now three weeks later. The fracture, like you predicted, it collapsed uh, because I think there wasn't enough spread at the fracture site, and the nail started hurting at the knee. And the child came back, and he he was in discomfort. So, uh, next slide, Sandeep, please. Uh, so, uh, so we had to take the child back to the operating room and uh, trim the prominent ends of the nail. Uh, which had backed out a little bit. And uh, next slide. Uh, and this is at eight weeks uh, from surgery, fracture started healing up. There wasn't any further collapse. I think the fracture started gluing up together. And uh, next slide. And uh, this is at six months uh, post-surgery, the fracture healed up. So uh, I think the point well taken that I think the nails need to be really bent uh, enough to prevent yeah. uh, collapse. Yeah. So, what is your comment on using the end caps, Dr. Antonio? Was it my comment? What? Using end caps. The end caps. The, -N -caps. the end caps when you when you really have a, a frayed or you you think there is something wrong. There is a, a very um, the, the 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 fracture is uh, really oblique, and then you think you are going to lose uh, some uh, some reduction. That that's the only uh, you know the the the. the the real main indication to use the caps. Otherwise, there is no really indication. So, it's very important to try to, to bend much more than you put the, the caps. The caps is like... Uh, okay. You know. <laughs> so you believe bending it more is more important than any cap? Yeah, you, you don't have a... Sometimes you, you, you have some you know, difficulties to, for, to progress or for the reduction. When, when you reduce... Uh, you have a get the reduction of the fracture with a good bending of the, the nails. So you are you are, you are reducing the proper way and you are pretty safe. Okay. You can see even the the, the very important callus formation is the the sign that there is the two thin uh, uh, nails. When you okay. when you when you appreciate on the X-ray, a very important the callus formation is very exuberant. One is due to the is not the proper size of the callus of the size of the nail. All right. So I think uh, let me just show a few cases now. So this was another length unstable eight-year-old child with a large life fragment, as you can see. But uh, as Antonio told us, I used elastic nails here. The only modification that we made after the reduction was we made sure that the nail went all the way into the neck region. And I actually perforated through the cortex. So this gave me an effect of uh, probably giving length stability like a locked nail. So just wanted to demonstrate that you can use this little trick if you have a yeah, you don't want to cross the Pisces, but you can do that. And I put it with a long leg for about three weeks. And
and uh, eventually that yield beautifully without any complications and that is at the end of implant removal so jungle uh, comminuted lens unstable fracture either an external fixator as suha showed can be done with plastic nails or you can try to pierce one part and to lock sort of nail so that it doesn't cut out if you don't have an end cap you can perforate to that any comment on that from any faculty channel excuse me because the the i heard really uh, difficult to 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 listen to you the the question uh, because i didn't understand exactly if you was an accidental perforation no, of the no, nails intentional. intentional okay yeah i i usually don't don't intentional uh, uh, you know perforate uh, the in this way because uh, i guess there is a module of elasticity you you need so it's better to have uh, from your introduction to manage with the caps uh, uh, if you need uh, more stability instead of uh, to uh, exit uh, outside even okay. if sometimes is accidental so i if you uh, you know realize that uh, after the the day after the the surgery you can leave it uh, because there is no no real problem and you can uh, you know waiting for a healing of the fracture without any problems but i i don't usually uh, intentionally exit from the from the from the bone from the okay. asymmetrical uh, property i agree because in this way you can uh, you can have a much more uh, stability and you can progress uh, inside the 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 neck of the the femoral neck is much better than the, you have a much more you know tissue where to encourage the, the your nails but anyway, okay. it's okay So this was another complex uh, hip fracture where you had uh, acetabulum bicolum fracture with a sharp femur, which was metaphasial. So again, uh, we had to do a major surgery where we fixed the acetabulum, both columns, and uh, then did a elastic nail uh, for the femur and protected that. That is uh, over a period of time. and uh, that is his ultimate result so yeah, even in junctional fractures and polytrauma you can still use elastic nails as for uh, cantonial as non treated it's not only diaphysial middle third fractures you can definitely use uh, elastic nails of bright size so yeah that's fine this? Yeah, no, it's yeah. fine. It's a it's, it's a good architecture of the inside. You can see almost at the at the, the fracture side it is the maximum of the bending, and so it's a proper size of the of the nails. And you can see it's a good healing. It is not exuberant callus formation. That's the re, that's the the uh, you, in in this way you can assess. There is a really good uh, choice of the nail size and a good architecture of the. Of the insertion of the nails, you can see is like so a natural healing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the amount of callus do you think it indicates instability? Scared in the in here. Does the amount of callus indicate stability? Sorry, I'm. He he is saying, does yeah. the amount of callus indicate instability? No, no, no. It indicated there is a proper size of the of the nails. If you use uh, uh, underestimated, uh, so uh, too thin uh, nail size, you have a more callus formation in the fracture side. Exactly. If you use the the, okay. the proper size, you have a, a like a natural fracture without a, nothing uh, callus formation because it is a proper size okay. of the technique. Okay. and that is a distal fracture again uh, like you demonstrated a retrograde nailing from proximal to distal divergent type with uh, good callus there and uh, so that you have already spoken about another example where a similar distal fracture was spiral fracture with a c and an s bend uh, to yeah. stabilize followed by a cast so in junctional fracture again in subsequent fractures we have found that occipital fragment goes into external rotation so we use this k wire to derotate the occipital fragment before we pass the nail any comment on that 
So did you use the, the key wire for what? I didn't understand. Uh, the proximal fragment lies in external rotation. And if we don't okay. get the rotation, then we may end up having a malrotation. And maybe that is the cause of abductor lurch, as uh, Suhas was pointing out. So do you use a derotation key wire before you pass the nails for upper third? Tony, what he is saying is the proximal fragment goes into external rotation. If you can, so he that. uses the K wire to derotate that fragment uh, before okay. passing the nail. Uh, okay, but uh, you you should try to to manage the, the the distal fragment or before to reduce it before to to fix the fracture. Otherwise, a, a little bit retrieving the 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 nails and then to reduce and then to insert again. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty difficult. I, I, I didn't use, uh, I never did use this technique. I don't know if it, it works because I can, I can learn something every time, but I really don't know if, if you are be able to, to manage in this way the rotation of, of the bone because- Yes, we can manage it very well. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. The important is the final outcome. Huh? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's only as good as the final result. Okay. And this is the system that you were showing uh, is to demonstrate elastic nails there to consolidate the cells. Okay. All right. So that's fine. That's it. I think I'll hand over to Dr. Johari to conclude. Well, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I must thank uh, Tony, as I call him Tony, and you know, Professor Andrakio for doing such a wonderful job, you know. Thank Just you. like we say, master of surgery, you know, is master of uh, <laughs> elastic stabilization. So we give you this honorary degree, you know, MES, <laughs> master of elastic stabilization. And uh, we don't know how you can do so much magic with the elastic uh, nailing, you know. So that's really wonderful. Uh, you told us all the applications of elastic nailing in the femur, distally and proximally, in the distal tibia, in the humerus, proximal and distal and for the radial uh, head radial neck fractures you know so we covered a very very huge ground you know today in this webinar you know i think you did go a little fast you know because you had to cover up so much area along with this literature search uh, of yours which was excellent you know um, we largely now know the case selection the indications for doing this sort of exercise and the tips and tricks of doing this sort of exercise so that I'm sure we'll be more confident now in tackling distal end fractures, you know, and proximal fractures, you know. So the metaphyseal type of injuries, I think we will be far more confident doing it with a titanium elastic nail. Um, it's so handy to use and so cost effective. I think it's a technique which everyone should know for application in um, large number of situations. So thank you, Tony. You've taken a lot of trouble for us and we really appreciate that. Um, I, I think all of us have learned a lot. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions we can take, but uh, I'll hand over to Dhiren uh, for um, the final remarks. You know. Yes, uh, before I uh, say thank you, there was another question. Uh, so the question was about when do you routinely remove tense nail? Uh, I usually for the for the lower limb uh, the the best timing is after seven nine months after the uh, the fracture and for the upper limb it depends if there's uh, any any trouble because sometimes it's very superficial for the humerus so you can but you can take off after five months it's it's okay but even after seven or eight months there is no problem uh, if you leave too much the, sometimes you have some trouble in order to uh, remove especially for the upper limb because there is more uh, also integration with the uh, because the, the, the medullary canal is thinner and the possibility to have a more in, impact uh, with the proximal part of the, the tip of the hazing. So it's better a little bit uh, earlier for the upper limb than the, the, for the lower limb. Okay, so with that, uh, we end this session. And once again, on behalf of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, I would like to thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all. Thank you for your invitation. I, Thanks uh, for really, I really enjoy with your, with you. Thanks so much. Okay. You. Come bye. again bye. then. Bye. bye. Sure. You can virtually come again to India. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I need it. <laughs>
great great right. presentation and, tony and Thank let's hope corona goes away and we can visit yeah 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 people <laughs> to visit okay. italy 